Hello, and welcome to Pathology Central Need to Know Histo. I'm Andrea Derup, a professor of pathology at Duke University School of Medicine and director of our Pathology Medical School course. I am also a co-editor of Robbins Essential Pathology and of the upcoming edition of Robbins and Kumar Basic Pathology. This video is primarily for medical students, those of you who are just beginning to learn about neoplasia and malignancy and how you can figure out whether something is a bad actor or whether it's benign. This could also be useful uh, for people who want to have a deeper understanding because what I want to show you is how the cells are communicating something to you about the behavior of the lesion. Now, I already covered this in an earlier talk, right? Some of you may be thinking, I'm not going to be a pathologist. Why do I need to know histopathology? And this video is going to focus primarily on these two aspects, that by looking at cells and determining what they're telling you, you'll be able to better understand disease mechanisms and you'll have enhanced meaning. You'll understand better what is going on in the patient. So, I have to begin with a disclaimer. I already said that this is for medical students, right? So I'm a pathologist and it takes years of training to become a pathologist. And a lot of what we do as part of our job is to determine whether something is benign or malignant. So I don't want to at all give you the impression that if you learn these five things, you're set to go out and become a pathologist, right? There are a lot of very subtle nuances. But what I'm going to be teaching about here is what you can see as a medical student, what is expected of you, by your faculty and by the board exams, the step exams, this is what they will expect. And let me give you an example. So there may be a clinical vignette, there will be a biopsy, and you may need to uh, answer a question regarding um, the clinical behavior of this lesion or what would be an appropriate treatment. And for that, you need to be able to know, looking at this lesion, is it benign or is it malignant? So these are five features that if you see them, are going to tell you that this is a malignant lesion and you need to be thinking about things like surgery and radiation or uh, uh, you know, trying to figure out will this, will, will this metastasize or will it not metastasize. This is telling you it's going to be aggressive. Once more, in the context of medical school. For those of you who want to learn more, become a pathologist. So I think of these features of malignancy as giving me a clue about what this is going on in that cell. So I think of cellular pleomorphism as being a cell that has forgotten who it is supposed to be, right? Something has changed in its DNA. It's no longer following the pattern that was set for it. So we're going to look at this uh, through figures. I think of these next ones, mitotic activity and necrosis, as showing me that the cells are proliferating rapidly. So if I'm seeing a lot of mitotic figures, this is telling me these cells are duplicating their DNA, they are dividing, they are proliferating rapidly. And if I see necrosis, I know that cells are growing so quickly that they're outgrowing their blood supply. So this is telling me something about the actual activity and behavior of these cells. Now, vascular invasion and perineural invasion are telling me that these cells are looking for a way out. They are on the move. This is the, the first step, the vascular invasion, to seeing a lymph node uh, metastases. Perineural invasion is a way, particularly when we think about the prostate, of the way the tumor is going out through these channels into the body. So these are telling you that the cells have got the idea to move on. So first, they've forgotten their, 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 their way. Second, they are growing rapidly. And third, they've pack their bags and they're moving on. Okay, so let's look at cells losing their way. This is a just beautiful image of a tubular adenoma. And I like it because it very nicely shows normal, happy uh, mucosa here. So let me bring up my pointer. So this is very happy colonic mucosal. It wakes up in the morning and says, I'm gonna make mucin this morning. And it's making mucin, right? These cells, these bad actors, right, something is up with them and they don't wake up and think, I'm going to make mucin. They think, oh, I'll make a little bit, but eh, not so much. I'm going to grow my, my nucleus a little bit more. I'm going to, I'm going to, there's stuff going on here. So let's take a closer look but, um, so you can see what I'm talking about. So once more, happy, well-behaved cells, nice basal nucleus, right, sitting right here, maintaining their polarity. That's what uh, the epithelium does. And happily, cheerfully making mucin. 
Compare that to these dysplastic areas. Now, once more, this is dysplasia, not frank malignancy, okay? So this is that first step before we get to pleomorphism that I wanted to show you so that you would understand the pathway. These cells, as you can see, are not making nearly as much mucin, and the nuclei are enlarged and dark, and some of them have left the basal surface, and you see them up closer to the lumen, right? One of the other things we'll typically see is uh, enhanced mitotic activity. So these cells are losing their way. They haven't gone completely malignant yet. They're still uh, staying bounded by the, um, by the basement membrane, and they haven't gotten really ugly and started doing things like cribriforming, which is a topic for another day. All right, now let's go on what happens when they've really lost their way. So this is what we call pleomorphism. And a lot of students have told me they get confused by this concept. So pleomorphism uh, to me means, so pleo means many, and morphism means shapes. So we have many shapes, and this is just a beautiful example. It's a sarcoma. Sarcomas are, are well known for really uh, showing a lot of pleomorphism when they become uh, high grade. And the way that I look at pleomorphism is that if I were able to take a tiny biopsy here and look at this, and if I took a tiny biopsy from here, another part of the same tumor, could I say that's the same tumor? I really couldn't because there's a lot of variability just in this one area. Also, does this cell look to me like this cell? Could I say, oh yeah, these, these guys are definitely related. No, this guy looks completely different. Here we have this big, uh, dark, convoluted nucleus. If you see something like this on an exam, right, this is malignant, okay? That's, that's all you need to know. You can move on from there. Now, I'm going to do something a little tricky here because students also get confused by what is the opposite of pleomorphism, and that's monomorphism. And if I want to show you something that's truly monomorphic, one shape, I'm going to show you another malignancy, right? Because in the natural milieu, the way a cell is, there's going to be some variation, right? There's little environmental differences, little, uh, little niches that each cell is in, so each one's going to be a little bit different. And you'll see that in a moment when we compare and contrast a leiomyoma and a leiomyosarcoma, two tumors of uh, smooth muscle. But if I really want to show you monomorphism, I'm going to have to show you another neoplasm. And this guy here is a synovial sarcoma. It's a chromosome associated, uh, chromosomal translocation associated uh, malignancy. And just as a clinical pearl for those of you who are further in your training, chromosomal translocation associated sarcomas tend to be very uniform and monomorphic, right? So if I knew nothing other than these, if someone said these were two sarcomas, one of them's associated with a chromosomal translocation, bingo, this is my guy. Okay, but the way you think about monomorphism, which you can see beautifully here, is that all these cells look exactly alike. If I could use a little clipping tool and take this cell out here and put it right here, you wouldn't know. They're all identical, okay? So this is not to tell you that uh, pleomorphism and monomorphism can't be used by you as you're trying to think about if some, whether or not something is malignant. This is just to provide a compare and contrast of pleomorphism versus monomorphism. Because you'll see in this next image, so these are two smooth muscle tumors, right? And the reason I wanted to show you that synovial sarcoma where it's very obviously monomorphic is that Sometimes students get confused by this benign smooth muscle tumor and say, well, th this cell's dark, and, and that one's dark, and this one's a little longer, and they don't all look the same. But the, the holding is the same thing, is that actually with these guys, since they're spindle cells and they're shaped like little hot dogs, if you cut a hot dog lengthwise, you get something that looks like that, and if you cut it on end, then you get a little donut. And so that's part of the reason why they look different. But just look at this thing and think about if you were to take this area here and put it over here, does it the same? It is. If you cut out this little spindle cell here and put them over here, it's the same. But this really becomes clear when you compare it to a leiomyosarcoma. So this is a malignant tumor of smooth muscle cells. And here you can see it all gets ugly, right? We have some gigantic cells, big, dark cells. Uh, we have other cells with more cytoplasm and areas where it gets crowded. So this is pleomorphism. So take this image and think about that. These cells are benign. They're still sort of doing what smooth muscle cells do. I'm supposed to, you know, make some actin filaments and contract. That's what I do. These guys are thinking, I'm not doing any of that. I got my own plans. I'm getting big. I'm getting ugly. I'm moving on. Okay. 
So the next thing we talk about is mitotic activity. And you may want to go ahead and hit pause and see how many mitotic figures you can identify. All right. Uh, this is a, 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 another sarcoma uh, because I, I'm a sarcoma pathologist and I happen to think they're, they're really amazing uh, tumors. Uh, so uh, this is um, an alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma. And here you can see the mitotic figures I've identified. All right, so mitotic activity is one thing, and you can see right here that this tumor is really proliferating. This is not to say that benign or normal unaffected tissues don't, uh, don't proliferate, because obviously we're all proliferating all the time. This is particularly uh, obvious uh, in the skin, in the epithelium, uh, in the uh, lining of the colonic, uh, the colonic, um, uh, the colon. <laughs> and uh, so we are proliferating, right? But this is a lot of proliferation right here uh, in this the very atypical looking um, uh, tumor. Now the other thing to keep in mind, right, is that all of these mitotic figures are normal. Here we have a nice uh, splitting. The, the chromosomes have come together here uh, in metaphase. They've all joined up. Now they've split. We're about to get a split down the middle to make a daughter cell. So this is all pretty happy. Here are two examples of atypical mitotic figures. These also are obvious clues that you're looking at something that's malignant. So if you see a biopsy, once more, on a test, uh, in a question, and it looks like a little T, or it looks like a tripod, or it's all messed up here looking like an asterisk uh, scrambled together, that's telling you this is malignant. I need to start thinking about where this tumor is going to metastasize, what sort of aggressive treatment to give this patient. Okay. Now here's just, uh, um, this is actually from that same tumor. Uh, here is our beautiful little uh, bipolar uh, normal mitotic figure from that same lesion. But here we can see necrosis. Now, I'm sure that you learned a lot about uh, necrosis uh, as you're you know, learning pathology, right? We spent a lot of time talking about necrosis and apoptosis. And this is a classic example, right? So this is going to be coagulative necrosis. You can see here, these cells are dying, right? So they're going to be a little bit hypoxic. They're still getting some oxygen diffusion. Uh, that's what this area is telling me, right? Because these guys are still viable. These guys haven't, and they've just died, and you can still see the cellular outline, so that's coagulative tumor necrosis. So this tumor, as it has grown, has left its blood vessel, uh, its, its uh, blood supply behind, okay? So necrosis, also in what you're looking at, an excellent feature to let you know something is malignant. All right, so this brings us now to lymphascular invasion. And as pathologists, we sometimes spend a fair amount of time looking for it because the big obvious way to know that there's been lymphascular invasion if, is if a patient has a metastatic tumor. So if you're looking at uh, a patient who has breast uh, cancer and there's a lymph node that has, uh, has malignant um, tumor in it, then you know that that tumor's metastasized. So that's part of staging. But we also like to know, are we at an early stage? So we always keep an eye out to see if a tumor is moving into the lymphatics uh, or into the blood vessels. Now this is a, an image from a squamous cell carcinoma. We're going to go on higher power uh, and get a better view of it. I'm also going to use some special stains. Uh, here is the overlying uh, uh, skin, which looks, the epidermis looks, you know, pretty, you know, boring and normal. Uh, it's, you know, maybe got a little bit of hyperkeratosis. Uh, this bluish tint here is solar elastosis. So this is what happens when skin is exposed to a lot of UV radiation. You get this breakdown uh, of the elastin fibers. But here is what we're interested in. So we can see here we have a nice little lymphatic here. Uh, and here, and in the middle of it is a hunk of tumor. Now I know that this is actually in the lymphatic vessel because, and not just some sort of artifact, because I don't even see any tumor around here. I'm not going to go into the complications of identifying whether something is truly lymphascular invasion or might be artifact. Just know if you see something like this, particularly in the context of inflammatory breast carcinoma, right? So that is a key uh, thing that you might see on the boards, uh, a woman who presents with uh, an inflamed, erythematous, uh, thickened uh, area on her breast. They may show you a biopsy, and you'll see something like this, something that looks very atypical inside a vascular space. That is telling you that that woman has inflammatory breast carcinoma. Okay, so here we have on higher power, we're showing you exactly where that tumor is. And then I'm just going to show you, just as an aside, right, so how do we as, as pathologists know this is actually in a blood vessel? 
Uh, this is looking at a special stain that we use, which is specific CD31 for endothelial cells. And you can see here, it's highlighting all of these blood vessels here uh, in the dermis. And here we can see highlighting it around this bit of tumor. We can also use uh, another stain, which is specific for uh, lymphatic uh, vessels, not, uh, not blood vessels as well. And you can see it here as well. So this may be something you'll see in a pathology report that with special stains, this was identified. Okay. So finally, this brings me to perineural invasion. And this is just uh, a really uh, beautiful example of perineural invasion. So this is something I used to have a, a test question uh, for uh, uh, some, my medical students where I showed something like this and I asked for the diagnosis and it was a you know, multiple choice question. And this is uh, from prostate and it's a prostatic adenocarcinoma. But I had a lot of students who didn't recognize that seeing this nerve enwrapped right here by tumor is telling you perineural invasion. This is not benign. This is prostate adenocarcinoma. You would see nothing like this in a benign entity. Uh, I took that question uh, off my exam because so many students didn't get it, but that's one of the reasons why I wanted to take the time to show you this very image so that you will recognize that if you see something like this, it is telling you again, this is a malignant tumor. All right, so I'd like to finish with uh, some questions so that you can hit pause and reflect on uh, what it is that you've learned during this video, the last 15 minutes. So what are five histologic features of malignancy? And what does each one tell you about the pathophysiology of malignancy? What is it telling you about those cells that is giving you a clue? And by recognizing this, what you'll be able to do is if you can't remember if something is uh, a, a sign of malignancy, think back to what it's telling you. With this understanding, you will be able to get there on your own. You don't need to memorize. All right, thank you very much. Please shoot me an email at pathologycentral at gmail.com uh, to let me know which other entities you'd like to do. Uh, is there a particular topic of uh, histology that you'd like me to, to address? And please don't forget to subscribe. Thank you very much and have a